this chapter is all about bonding. And we started this chapter with a section talking about ionic bonding. We transitioned into covalent bonding. And that's where we are. And the rest of this chapter is on molecules, covalent compounds. And the first little topic that we're going to do today is the only bit of math in this entire chapter 8 and 9 section. And it is on bond energies, okay? which we have already discussed. We have already discussed that a bond energy means the energy required to break a bond. Now we haven't yet talked about multiple bonds, which we're going to start seeing more and more starting today. Let's just back up and make sure that we all remember what makes an ionic bond different from a covalent bond, okay? Remember that in both cases, you have two particles who are trying to both achieve that stable octet of electrons around them. Both ionic and covalent, both particle, the two particles involved in the bond are trying to achieve a stable octet. What are covalent bond, or what is a, a covalent bond, these two particles, what are they doing in order to get that stable octet? Yes, Sarah? They're sharing electrons, sharing a pair or more than one pair of electrons. What happens in an ionic bond? Meg? One Correct. One takes the electrons from another. There is a full transfer. There's no sharing. But if we're talking covalent, talking electron pairs are being shared, anytime we say a single bond, what we're really saying is it's not two particles sharing one electron, it's two particles sharing one pair of electrons. And a double bond is sharing two pairs. Triple is sharing three pairs. Okay? And when you start talking about multiple bonds, you can talk about bond length and bond strength. Okay? And I'm just gonna do a little little demonstration here, okay? If this rubber band represents one pair of electrons that I'm sharing between my two hands, my particles, okay? If it's just one, I can stretch it pretty far, okay? A single bond can be relatively long in length, okay? If I go to a double bond, okay, I can't stretch it quite as far. A double bond is not as long as a single bond, and I'm feeling a greater force on my fingers with two rubber bands. The strength of a double bond is greater than a single. If I add a third to the mix, do a triple bond, it's the shortest of all of them, and the strength is the greatest. Okay? It's an inverse relationship. A single bond in comparison to these other two is relatively long and relatively weak compared to the other two. A triple bond compared to the other two is relatively short and relatively strong compared to the other two. So, here's where, oh, uh, let me say one other thing. Um, this, I want you just to be aware of this term. I'm not going to use it very often, but you might see it in your textbook. You might see it on a test question or on the AP exam. Anytime you see the term bond order, that just means the number of bonds. Um, instead of saying this is a double bond, you might see it said as this bond has a bond order of two. This one has a bond order of three. It's just another way to say the same thing. Okay. Now, okay, let's just review for a second. Remember the term bond energy. 
means the, bond, uh, the energy required to break a bond, which is an endothermic process. If breaking a bond is endo, forming a bond must be exo. Okay? And we're going to use that fact to calculate something we haven't seen in a little while. What's delta H? Change in heat energy. Do you remember the fancy word for heat energy? Enthalpy. Okay. When we were back in chapter 6 and 16, we had multiple ways to calculate the delta H of a reaction. We could use calorimetry, MC delta T. We could use the that big chart in the back of the textbook, products minus reactants. We could do a Hess's Law problem where you rearrange the equations so that they add up to equal what you want. Multiple ways. Here is yet another way to find the change in heat energy for a reaction. Okay, This looks more complicated than it actually is. What does sigma mean mathematically? Summation, okay? The summation of the energies to, of all the bonds being broken minus the summation of all the bonds being formed, okay? Energy required minus energy released. I want you to make a note that in your textbook, page 351, there is a chart that has all these bond energies listed for you, okay? Bond energies, which is what's going to get plugged in here and here, will be given to you. And there is a chart that you can go and look them up anytime you need them. So I'm going to do a very simple problem with you, and then I'm going to let you do a more complicated one on your own. So this question says, using the bond energies listed, here they are, okay, calculate delta H for this reaction. I see coefficients. Remember, if you see coefficients, you may assume that it is balanced properly, and it needs to be balanced. On the previous slide, the equation was bonds broken minus bonds formed. Which side, reactants or products, will I be breaking bonds? The reactant side. I will be forming bonds on the product side. Okay, great. Well, let's write it out. Delta H equals. Let's deal with the bonds broken first. Here's the first bond that I need to break, an end-to-end -end triple bond. And there's just one, it's got a coefficient of one, takes 941 joules, okay? If that's not the only bond to be broken, here's another reactant that I'll have to break. Two H's bonded together like that. How many H2H -H single bonds will I have to break here? three of them. So I need to multiply three times, here it is, 432. And that's all of my bonds that need to be broken. Bonds broken minus bonds formed. Now be careful with this, okay? Ammonia involves N to H single bonds. Don't answer immediately. How many N to H single bonds am I going to be forming? Two is not correct. Six. Okay. Here's what ammonia looks like. You see that each ammonia has three N to H bonds. One, two, three, times two. So that's six N to H single bonds. Now, 
if you are at all concerned that you didn't know that, okay, we are going to be focusing today on drawing Lewis structures. So if this was something you didn't remember, you will by the end of today. So don't fret. Before you start putting numbers in your calculator, I want to give you an option here. Somebody yesterday pointed this out and I thought it was really, really astute. An astute observation. She said, if this is bonds broken, and this is bonds formed, bonds broken, that's an endothermic process. So the energies should be positive. Okay, good, they are. This is bonds formed, which is an exothermic process. And she said, well, how come the energies aren't negative? Well, you have a choice here, people. You can either think of this as bonds broken minus bonds formed, or you can think of it as the summation of all the energies in this entire equation, as long as you remember that anything on the product side needs to be a negative energy. <coughs> it's your choice, you'll get the same answer. Okay. I personally prefer to just do it as a subtraction, but it's your choice. Okay. We do the math, and this is what you should get. Now let me ask you two questions. First of all, if all of these bond energies had units of kilojoules per mole, well, my final answer doesn't have units of kilojoules per mole. What happened to the mole? Austin. Okay. Yeah, when we took these coefficients into account, that's essentially like taking this number and multiplying times the number of moles, which causes it to cancel out. I want you to notice that my final answer here is negative. What does that mean? This reaction is exothermic. If this reaction were going on in my coffee mug, hopefully not, would it feel hot or cold to my hands? Hot. So that was a relatively simple one. I want you to try one that's more complex. And I'm going to give you a little assistance to start. Okay? I'm sorry I couldn't write it all out in one straight line. Okay? This reactant, this reactant, and this product, I think you'll be okay with. But this and this, it's a little tricky. What I am going to show you, because I really would recommend this for some of these more complex molecules, I'm going to show you how to draw them out. That way you can visually see how many bonds there are and what type. Okay? So watch how I'm going to draw this molecule out. This molecule looks like this. Double bond. Okay. That's what that looks like. Now this two is a coefficient for this entire molecule. Okay, this two goes for this entire molecule. This two goes for this entire molecule. I want to make sure something is clear because somebody yesterday asked me, how would I know to draw it out like this and not like this? C H2 double bond to C to H da 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 and so on and so forth. How come that's illegal? And if you don't remember, you will by the end of today. Ava. Correct. Hydrogen can only have two electrons next to it. Remember, this line is a pair of electrons. Hydrogen can't do this. That's illegal. 
this is the only way you could draw this out. Okay. So, let me erase this. Everything here, these are all the bonds broken. Everything down here, these are bonds formed. Okay, remember that this is a coefficient, this is a coefficient. Try it. Bonds broken minus bonds formed. Give it a try. Start with one type of bond, like start with just C to H single. <clears throat> Count how many total there are, and then move on to the next type of bond. You don't have to draw it. You don't have to draw it at all. Do you all agree that the math is not that hard, but it is easy to make a little mistake? Yes. So, here's my suggestion. Listen, I have no idea when our next test is, but whenever it is, there is definitely going to be a question like this on free response. It is in your best interest. If you can write as much out as you possibly can, then you're more likely to get some partial credit. Okay, is a drawing required? No. But if you draw something, and I can see, and maybe this answers your question, if you drew something out completely wrong, but then for that wrong drawing, all of your numbers match, you might lose one point out of four or five instead of all points, okay? So just be careful with these, okay? All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to teach, okay? By the time we get through chapters eight and the very small portion of chapter nine that we're gonna cover, you will be able to give me what I call a complete description of any molecule I choose. Now, what's included in a complete description? That would be drawing a Lewis structure, which we're going to focus on today, predicting the geometry, the shape, okay? It's called the Vesper model. I know that's spelled like it should be Vesper, but we say Vesper, I don't know. Okay? Included in the Vesper model would not only be shape, like trigonal planar, tetrahedral, but bond angle, polarity. And then in chapter 9, we'll talk about what's called the hybridization of a molecule. And that's a very quick, short little topic. Okay. This is what we're going to do today. We'll focus on the shapes on Thursday. Now, here's the thing, okay? Lewis structures show you what elements are bonded to what 
and where the valence electrons are located, okay? Keep in mind that electrons can move around. If, just because fluorine has seven valence electrons doesn't mean that those seven valence electrons have to stay right with fluorine. They can move to another place in the molecule if electrons are needed. Okay. But the central thing, the central idea on drawing a Lewis structure is that elements typically have four pairs <coughs> of electrons around them. Four pairs is how many? Eight. Why is it that elect or atoms tend to have eight around them? What's so great about having eight electrons around them? It makes them feel, it makes them feel complete. It makes them happy. It makes them energetically stable. Okay? It makes them like a noble gas. And most atoms follow that rule. It's called the octet rule. Octet means a group of eight. There are some exceptions, which we're going to see today. These are some that you may have seen in Chem 1. We'll see some more later on today that you may not have seen before. Okay. I actually mentioned this just a few minutes ago. Hydrogen does not have four pairs around it. It will have how many pairs? One. Just one. Two electrons, one pair. Okay. It's on energy level one. It can only support two electrons next to it. Now these two, which are on energy level two, could support an octet, but for whatever reason, they don't. Does anybody remember from Chem 1, beryllium will have how many pairs around it? Pairs. Two. Two pairs. Okay. Do you remember boron how many? Boron will have three pairs. Okay, so those are some exceptions to that octet rule. Now, what is on this slide and the next is a series of steps for how to draw a Lewis structure, and they must be done in this order. Do not worry about remembering these steps. I guarantee, or your money back, I guarantee that by the time you walk out of this room today, you will have these steps memorized. I will tell you, different Chem 1 teachers teach Lewis structures with slight variations. It's not that one way is wrong and the other way isn't, okay? But, and I'm not saying my way is the best way, but what I am saying is that the way I'm going to show you here works for any and all bizarre exceptions. I don't know how other teachers teach it. And I don't know if their method will work with some of these weird exceptions we're going to see today. So just follow these steps. Okay, thanks. All right. Don't try to write this down. Just don't. We're going straight to some examples. And if you have the slides, you will notice that I am following these step by step. We're going to do three examples together. We'll start with something very simple. You all will find that this is going to come back to you pretty quickly, which is good. So here's the first example we're going to do. And step one says, identify the central atom. Which one do you think it's going to be? Correct. It is often, not always, often the element written first, okay? The one that there is only one of. I will tell you all, you might want to make a note somewhere, if carbon is in your compound, carbon is always the central atom. Okay, so I've done that. Step two, find the total number of valence electrons. Please tell me how many valence electrons phosphorus has. Okay, five. How about iodine? Seven times three. So 21 plus five, that's 26. 26 total electrons. But I care less 
ladies and gentlemen, about how many electrons I have to work with. I care more about how many pairs I have to work with. So step three says divide this number in half. 13 pairs. Step four says draw a framework using single bonds. Okay, well, we said P would be in the center. And I'm going to draw these three iodines around it like this. If you want to put this iodine on the top, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Okay. Please tell me what this line represents. No. Uh, what does it represent? No, not alone. Oh, one pair. Okay, yes, one pair of electrons, and it's being shared. It's called a shared pair. Well, I've just drawn three lines. I had 13 pairs to work with. I just used up three of them. So I have 10 left. Anything that you have left, which you won't always, by the way, Anything that's left over is not going to be a shared pair. What do you call it? Okay, you can call it one of two things. You can call it a lone pair or an unshared pair. Mm -hmm. Question. What happens if you have a, like, like an odd number? Yeah. Uh, you won't. Mm -hmm. You won't. Okay, so. It's not that that doesn't exist, Chris. It's just that you will never see that, okay? Do any of you remember from Chem 1, where do you put, well, first of all, how do you even draw lone pairs? We don't draw lines. Dots. And where do you put them first, James? Nope. So if not the central, what do we call the outside ones? Not central. Terminal. Okay, watch. Here we go. One pair, two pair, three pair. Can I put any more on this iodine? Why not? It's full. It's got four pairs. One pair, two pair, three pair. Four, five, six, shush, seven, eight, Nine, where do you suggest I put the ten? Okay, and I'm out. I don't have any more. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that is not very AP Chem lingo-ish. Are all the atoms happy? Yes. What am I really asking you? Do they all have four pairs around them, and do they? Yes, this is a happy little molecule. Yay. Now, let me say two things before we do another example. Okay, this was a very simple example. First thing I want to say to you, because a lot of our upcoming test will be you drawing molecules and you're being graded on how they're drawn. Be deliberate with your lone pairs. I can't tell you how frustrating it is to see something drawn, nice little structure, and the lone pairs are drawn like this. Huh? Can you in the back even see that? Kind of. Exactly. My point. I need to be able to tell that you are clearly drawing a lone pair, not just some random stray marks from your pencil. And I bet I know what you're going to ask next. We're allowed to do this for a lone pair. Mm -mm. The AP exam does not recognize that. You may not draw lines. You must draw dots for lone pairs. <laughs> okay? That was simple. We're going to start moving up a little bit more in complexity. What's that? 
What's the central atom? Could hydrogen be in the middle? No. Why not? It can only be bonded to one thing. Okay, so fine. Let's tally up our total electrons. Nitrogen has five. There are four hydrogens. Each one has one. So I'm waiting for somebody to catch this. Meg. It is odd. That's odd. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. A plus one charge means one electron has been lost. Question, Chris. Wait, a coefficient? We're not in an equation. There's no equation here. Oh, like like on a couple slides back, what we were doing? No, no. Pay no attention to the coefficient. When you're drawing a molecule, pay no attention to the coefficient. Okay, so that's four pairs, yes? Okay. <coughs> and I'm out. Are all the atoms happy? They are. Is this drawing complete? Why not? Ah, good. I was hoping someone would remember. If it has an overall charge, you put brackets around your entire drawing and put the charge outside. What would you have done if the charge wasn't plus one, but plus three? Subtract three. What if the charge was negative five? I would have added five electrons. So you're never going to get an odd number. No, I okay. Does that, it is possible, but you won't see it. Okay. Here's our last example together. What's our central atom? N. Let's tally it up. Five plus three times six. What do I do with this? I mean, you add, one. add one more electron. Okay, so that's 12 pairs. Let's draw it out. Single bonds first. Nine is three, so now I have nine lone pairs. Two, three, four, oh. five, six, seven, eight, nine, and I'm out. Is everybody happy? Who's not happy? Okay. If your central atom does not have enough, okay. Pick any lone pair you want. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to pick this one. You can pick whichever one you want. That's why I said maybe it would be a good idea to use pencil and not pen. That pair of electrons goes from being a lone pair and it turns into a share pair. Please understand, have I taken away something from oxygen? No, it still has four pairs around it. But now nitrogen does too. So everybody's now happy. <coughs> the brackets around it. Okay, go.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me say something here because a couple of people have already asked this. The, the shape in which you draw these does not matter. For example, H2S, I drew it out in a straight line. You don't have to. Some people would have drawn this in like an L shape, and that's fine. Okay? All that matters is that the right elements are connected to the right elements, and they have the right number of shared pairs and lone pairs. Other than that, I don't care how you draw them. Okay? This H on, nit on ammonia does not have to be on the bottom. It's your choice. You don't have to draw this one in a straight line. Okay? The shape in which you draw them does not matter. If you didn't quite get through all of these, don't worry, you're going to get plenty of practice. Oh, we're doing more, don't worry. We'll do plenty. Yay, practice. Now, we have talked about, listen, we have already seen some exceptions to the octet rule, like hydrogen, beryllium, boron. Listen, there are other elements that don't go under the octet rule. They actually exceed the octet rule. There are some elements that can have five pairs around them, some that can have six pairs around them. Okay? Now, can any nonmetal do this? No. The only elements that can do this that can exceed the octet rule are elements in the third period of your periodic table. So nonmetals like phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, the third period or lower. And why is that? Because those are the only elements that have available D orbitals where pairs could go. Think about it. In the D sublevel, what's the first row? 3D. 3D. There's no such thing as 1D or 2D. So the first elements that can, and they don't always, can exceed the octet rule would be elements in the third energy level or greater. Again, if you follow those steps, you don't have to worry about some of these bizarre exceptions because the steps still work. And we're going to do one of these together. Let's do chlorine trifluoride. What's the central atom going to be? Chlorine. chlorine. Okay. Let's tally up total valence electrons. How many total? 28. So how many pairs? 14. 14. Let's draw it out, chlorine in the center. Fourteen minus three, that leaves eleven lone pairs. Where do I put them first? Terminal atoms. Here we go. One pair, two pair, three pair. Pair, five pair, six, seven, eight, nine. I have two more to go. Okay? But guys, if you look at the steps that I've written out on the slide, okay, if any pairs are left over still, no matter how many there are, they go on the central atom. As bizarre as this looks, there are two lone pairs and three shared pairs on that central atom. That's five total pairs. But that's what it is. Try these others. I3 minus is a little bizarre. Don't try to draw it. Connect them as a triangle.
this last one, there really wasn't anything like we had over here. There wasn't really any kind of bizarre situation. The electrons worked out pretty typically. The reason I put this one on this exception slide is because it's a noble gas. And we've said noble gases don't bond. They don't bond. Well, the two biggest noble gases, xenon and radon, can occasionally bond with other nonmetals. And here's the reason why. Okay? Would you say that xenon and radon have very strong or very weak effective nuclear charges? Weak, okay. Why? Because they are such large atoms, okay. The distance between their nuclei and the valence electrons is relatively large compared to the other noble gases. And I'm going to say something that, that puts personality on atoms, and that's not usually a good thing because they don't have feelings, but the gist is xenon, radon, maybe even krypton, I'm not sure, those electrons are so far away from the nucleus that the nuclei are, they're like, eh, whatever, I don't care. Take my electrons, I don't care. Okay? I don't like to put personality on atoms, but that's essentially what it is, whereas like, Neon and argon, which have a strong charge, are like, don't take my electrons! Okay, they're holding on to them really tight. Folks, here is our last topic. And I don't like this example, I'm putting a new one. Hooray. Polyatomic ion nitrite, NO2 minus. I want you to look at those two drawings and please tell me which one is correct and which one is incorrect. They're both yes. Aha, they're both correct. What's the difference? Where the double bond is. Okay? Whether it's drawn on the left or the right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a phenomenon called resonance, okay? It's when you can draw more than one valid structure for a molecule, like this is an example, okay? And here's the point, okay? What, when I said, what's the difference, you said the location of that double bond. Well, this extra pair of electrons doesn't exactly sit either on the right or on the left. It's called resonance because, and this is kind of a controversial topic, like there are chemists out there that don't really agree with this statement, but we're gonna say it, okay? That extra pair of electrons moves, jumps, location, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, so fast that actually neither one of these is correct. I'm going to draw something, listen everybody, I'm going to draw something that I don't ever, ever want to see you write on a test. I'm going to draw it to help you understand the concept. Forgive me if I don't draw in all my lone pairs. <laughs> no, 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 no. Those aren't lone pairs. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how my professor in college presented this topic of resonance. Okay? If you ask somebody to describe what a rhinoceros looks like, okay? You might say it has one horn on the top of its head, kind of like a unicorn, right? Okay, 
You might also say, if you're describing its body type, you might say it has a body type kind of like, like a dinosaur, like a triceratops body. Would you agree? Well, it does. Go look at a picture of a triceratops. Okay? This is a unicorn. Do unicorns exist? No. This is a triceratops. Do triceratops, are they around today? Museums. No, the answer is no. <laughs> Does a rhinoceros exist? Yes. 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 Okay. A rhinoceros exists. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what nitrite really looks like. Okay? No, not like a rhinoceros. <laughs> oh, no. The point is, neither one of these things exists today. A unicorn is a mythical creature and these aren't, aren't on the earth anymore. Neither one of these is truly what nitrite looks like. This is what it really looks like. Now, can you draw this on a test? No, you may not. Don't shoot the messenger. You have to draw both of them. Okay? Here's the point. Are you ready? Why are we even talking about this? Because if this is what nitrite really looks like, that means that these two bonds are identical. Do they look identical here? No. Single, double. That's not identical. But in fact, they are. You will be asked questions about bond length and bond strength. This is not a single bond. It's not a double bond either. What is it? It's like one and a half, okay? You can't draw this picture. You can't say this is like a bond and a half. Remember, we're in this time of year where everything is about how you say it, what, how you phrase it, what vocabulary. Hold on. Here's how you get around saying that this is like a bond and a half. You have to draw them both out and you would say that the bond length is between that of a single and double bond. That's how you get around saying it. Don't say a bond and a half, and don't draw that picture. You say the bond length is between that of a single and double bond, okay? I'm gonna give you an example question that you might see on free response in just a second. And yes, you do need to talk about this concept of resonance. But please, please, please don't call them jumping electrons, okay? You have a choice. Remember, it's all about wording, it's all about vocabulary. You have a choice in how you say jumping electrons. You can either call them resonating electrons, that's okay, or what's written on the slide, the super fancy way that I prefer, but it's your choice. You could also call them delocalized electrons. Think about it. The word localized means in one location and isn't moving around. It's staying put. Delocalized means something that can move around. Okay. Let me show you another example and then this will get into like what a, pro a, a possible question could be. Could I draw more resonance structures for this? Does this have resonance? Yeah. I could put the double bond here or here. I would have to draw three of them out. I know, it's a pain. Okay, you said this one would have three. If this one was like a bond and a half, this one would be like a bond and a third. Okay, now think about it. Single bond, bond and a third, this one was like a bond and a half, double bond, okay? 
here's a question that I have seen before. Nitrite versus nitrate. Which one has the longer average bond length? Okay, now guys, this the, there's a lot that has to be included in a question like this. The answer is nitrate. Please don't shoot the messenger. If this were a free response question, you would have to draw out all five Lewis structures. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And you would say something along the lines of, although both of these have a bond length between a single and double, you can't say a bond and a third, a bond and a half. You know how you get around saying that? Okay. You would say the bond, the average bond length in nitrate is closer to the length of a single bond. That's how you get around saying it. Do you want me to give the full complete answer? Okay. I'll say it a couple of times. First of all, you would need to have all five structures drawn out. And I would say, although both nitrite and nitrate have an average bond length between a single and double bond, due to delocalized electrons, fancy schmancy, nitrate's average bond length is closer to that of a single bond. You want me to say it one more time? Okay. Although nitrite and nitrate have an average bond length between that of a single and double bond due to the delocalized electrons, nitrate has an average bond length closer to that of a single bond. Which one would you say has the greater bond strength? Nitrite. Okay. Yep. And for the exact same reason. You could literally write the exact same response except changed anywhere you said length to strength. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to say, guys, is not everything with multiple bonds has resonance. And I want to make sure that you could recognize something that has resonance and something that doesn't. What about, forgive me again for not drawing in all my lone pairs. Would that have resonance? Yes. How many resonance structures could you draw in total? One doesn't means there's no resonance. Two. I could put the double bond here or there. That's two. If I put it here, well, it's a different molecule. Okay? Remember, the structure has to be the same. What about um, something like this? No. No. This has no resonance. Putting that double bond somewhere else changes the molecule. Good question. So, how would you know that the double bond goes on the O and not here? Okay, two possible situations. Either the question will say something to you, like, like a hint almost, the double bond is next to the oxygen, which I have seen that, or they don't say anything, but they have to accept that as a possible structure. Okay. So there would be two resonated and three correct Well, if it's a question asking you something about resonance and you put that double bond there, that might be a clue that that's not right because you can't draw another resonance structure. And guys, someone last class asked a great question. This is the last thing I'm going to say. If you're dealing with a question that has to do with nitrate, no matter what the question is, do you always have to draw out those resonance structures? No, you don't. You only have to draw them all out if the question applies to the concept of resonance. If it was just 
draw nitrate and identify the shape, that has nothing to do with resonance. You don't need to draw them out. Okay? 